Good to see all of you here this morning. Thank you for being here. Happy birthday, Jono. Now, you qualify to dream dreams. <laughs> because the Bible says, isn't it, that old men will dream dreams? <laughs> okay, praise God. Can we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5? Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 5, and in whichever version you may have of your Bible, can we read it together? 6 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with, with all your soul, and with all your might. Amen. Amen. Now, this is a commandment from God, and this is also repeated in the New Testament, which we will look at later in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. And the title that I have given my message this morning is The One Thing That Is Needed. The One Thing That Is Needed. God wants to be the number one in our lives. He wants to be loved above all other loves. So why does God want us to love him in such a manner? You know, C.S. Lewis, before he became a Christian, he said this, he complained about God saying, God's demand to be praised and loved sounded like a vain woman who wants compliments. And the great Oprah Winfrey said this. Apparently says, she said that she walked out of Orthodox Christianity because to her, the biblical God who demands our affection in such a manner cannot be a good God or a loving God. And she claims to be a Christian still. You know, people, God is not on an ego trip. Neither does he need your love or my love. From eternal past, the Trojan God was perfectly satisfied, perfectly glorified, perfectly worshipped, perfectly honored, perfectly loved within the Trojan God, within the Godhead. He doesn't need you and me or even the heavenly host to worship him or to love him. So whether we love God or whether we don't love God, it doesn't make him a lesser God. God is God. He's sovereign and he'll always be upon the throne, completely glorified, completely worshipped. But God loves us so much that he wants the best for us and he knows that this best is only found in a loving relationship with him. Outside that relationship, we will not find the goodness of God. You know, there's this story, I'm sure you have heard it, even if you have not heard it, please be kind and laugh at the end of it, okay? <laughs> the Sunday school teacher teaching six-year-olds, she was teaching them about salvation. And then after this uh, lesson, she asked, children, supposing I was a very good person, I helped the poor, I fed the needy, I took care of them, would that take me to heaven? And everybody shook their heads with a big, no teacher. Then she said, what if I was kind to animals? You know, I go around collecting all the stray animals. I bring them home. I give them shelter. I feed them. I rescue them. Would that take me to heaven? Again, a shaking of heads and a large, big, no teacher. Then she said, what if I was obedient to my mom and dad? And even though my brothers and sisters are mean to me, I will still be kind to them. Would that take me to heaven? Again, a shaking of head and no teacher. So then the teacher asks, so how do I get to heaven? And one little boy stood up and said, teacher, you got to die. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that is true, isn't it? We all got to die to go to heaven unless the Lord returns and we are raptured before that. You know, John 14, in John 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms, are many mansions. If it was not so, I wouldn't tell you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I am going to return to take you with me so that you may be where I am also. That is the heart of God, that we may remain with him where he is, that we will be there with him as well. But church, God doesn't want us to wait until we die to enjoy his presence or to enjoy his goodness. 
He wants us to enjoy his goodness while we are still alive on this earth. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me, they shall not thirst. John 6.35 you know, church, we could hunger and thirst and run after many things, but we will never find true satisfaction. Only Jesus can truly satisfy us. Outside of Jesus, we will be always needing, we will be always wanting. Now, in order for us to love God, or for us to respond to his great love. We first need to receive a revelation of his love, isn't it? We can only respond to his love when we get a revelation of his love. So King David, he says in Psalms, in Psalm 139, 17 to 18, he says that God's thoughts towards us, his good and loving and kind thoughts towards us outnumber even the grains of sand. And we know no one can ever count the grains of sand, can we? Meaning God's love towards us is immeasurable. Psalm 8 says, When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moons and the stars, what is man that you are mindful of him? You know, according to scientists, there are about 100 to 200 billion known galaxies. And recently someone said, I wrote, read that there are two trillion galaxies, known, discovered galaxies. And there's an average of 100 million stars in every galaxy. And these are known galaxies and known stars. And recently, two days ago, I read that an astrologist, astrologist discovered a galaxy stretching at least 16 million light years away in space. And the psalmist says that in spite of the splendor and wonder of all this, God's thoughts are for you and for me. He values you and he values me much more than the galaxies and the stars and all the stuff. Psalm 32, 8 says that God guides you with his eyes. In other words, he never takes his eye off you, eyes off you. Luke 12, 7 says that he loves you so much that he knows and he has even counted the hairs, the number of hairs on your head. Not going to comment on that. <laughs> he, he watches over us jealously. We are his precious treasure. Psalm 17, 8, Zechariah 2, 8. Exodus 34 speaks of his God's great and personal love towards us. And when you read and meditate a scripture such as Psalm 139, you will be overwhelmed by his love. So let us consider a few people in the Bible who had this revelation of God's love and as a result, they sought God above all else. Sorry. David, in Psalm 27, 4, he says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of his holiness upon his face, and to inquire in the temple. In other words, to seek his presence, to dwell, to sit down, to remain in his presence, and to inquire means to seek his ways and seek his guidance, to seek what pleases him most. So here we see David's number one desire was God's presence. Psalm 42.1, we read, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. You know, the psalmist, we are told that he was in exile when he wrote this psalm. And probably when he was in Jerusalem, he was a worship leader. And now he cannot visit the temple because he, he is in captivity. And this psalm tells us of his yearning. He's expressing his intense longing to be in the presence of God and to worship him. And in the New Testament, Luke chapter 10, verse 42, we all know the story of Mary and Martha. While Martha was involved doing good things, in, he was involved in ministry and in service, but Mary... She was seeking the presence of Jesus at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus responds to Martha and says, there is only one thing that is necessary. 
and Mary has chosen the good portion which will never be taken away for her, from her. And this word good, the word is agathon in Greek or agathos. And that means the goodness that originates from God. And when we are in the presence of God, we are surrounded, we are enfolded in the goodness of God. Amen. And that is where God wants us to be, isn't it? In a deep, intimate, loving relationship with God. Journeying for his presence so that we can enjoy his very best in our lives. You know, in the Old Testament, God promised prosperity for those who walked faithfully in his presence. And this mainly meant in the Old Testament, it was about long life. It was about land and livestock. And it was about descendants and offspring. And also victory, victory, victory over their enemies. Even today, God wants us to enjoy his blessings. He wants to prosper us. And today, the word prosperity has become like a bad word. You know, we are so hesitant to use the word prosperity in the church because of false teachers, for the false communication of this word. But the fact is, God wants to prosper us. Prosperity comes from God. By this I mean a life blessed with his peace and joy, no matter what circumstances we may find ourselves in. Strength to face challenges in life and live victoriously and as overcomers. To excel in everything that we do and everything that we undertake in. To have faith that moves, moves mountains and parts that it sees in our lives. To have godly families and to raise godly children. The list goes on. And of course for pastors it's you know, a luxury lifestyle, exotic holidays, mansions, posh cars. Did I hear someone say amen? <laughs> Strike that out, okay? Church, God wants to bless us with his very best. To live a grace-filled, grace-overflowing life. That's his desire for us. You know, the Old Testament and the New Testament are filled with many accounts of the blessings that came to those who sought and lived within God's presence. Let me remind you of some. You know, God's presence was evident in Abraham's life, wasn't it? He was blessed with prosperity in every area. He had land, he had livestock, he lived long, he had descendants, he had great wisdom, he had great leadership. Why? Because he always sought the presence of God. God. God's presence was so evident in his life that even the heathen around him recognized the difference between their lives and Abraham's. And King Abimelech appeared and he said this, he spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Genesis 21:22. This heathen king was saying, Abraham, there's something different about you. God guides you and blesses you wherever you go. Church, if we are those who seek God's presence, even the unbelievers will see that something special is in you and they will draw to you. I know, I'm sure you have experienced this. We are even unbelievers when they are going through difficulties or problems. They come to you for advice. They come to you for prayer. They may not come and say, I see God in you. But if you're a person who lives within the presence of God, they will see what Abimelech saw in Abraham. Amen? You know, God promised Joshua, in Joshua 1, 5 to 6, that no enemy could stand against him. He said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. I will not leave you. Nor will I forsake you. Be strong and be courageous. Why? Because of God's presence. When God's spirit is present within us, we can stand strong. We can stay courageous. And we can be confident that no enemy can ever defeat us. Amen? God told Gideon, and listen carefully, he said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. God, go in this might of yours. And you shall save Israel. Judges 6, 12, 14. Notice something. 
God did not say, go in my might. Rather, he said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel. God was saying, Gideon, there's something might, something mighty in you. Something that is so powerful that it can save Israel. And that might is my presence with you. Because you sought my presence. He was saying, your weakness will be made perfect in my strength. Even though Gideon lacked courage, God wanted to prove that any person can do great things when God's presence is with them. You know, we know how Gideon was stretching wheat in the, uh, at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites, the enemy. And some people think of Gideon as a coward, but God did not see him that way. And personally, I believe he was doing something positive. He did not use the circumstance that he was in to complain and to grumble. Rather, he made use of whatever was uh, available in those circumstances to do something positive, to be productive, and to you know, take care of his family. Amen? In Jeremiah 15:20. God warned Jeremiah. He said that the whole nation would turn against you and reject your prophecies. Yet God promised, saying, they shall fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you. God is saying, no matter, even if the whole country turns against you, Jeremiah, all that matters is that my presence is with you. Be confident of that. There's no doubt that these men and several others in the Bible, they sought after God. God was their priority. You know, David Wilkerson, in one of his books, he wrote this about the presence of God. He said, it makes you stronger than a lion and bigger than a giant, pulling down every wall and stronghold that comes against you. So true, isn't it? You know, I believe that what grieves God most is our lack of love towards him. Let me take you to the book of Revelation, which records this amazing vision that the apostle John had in the Isle of Patmos. In the first three chapters, John sees Jesus walking in the midst of seven New Testament churches. Now, these churches were real churches, functioning churches in real localities. And Jesus is addressing these seven churches. But hear me carefully, church. Through these chapters, Jesus is not only speaking to those particular churches, but Jesus is also speaking to us today, to the global church, to the local churches, including follow me, and to every individual believer. That means you and me. And this morning, I want to consider just one particular church that Jesus addressed in this chapter. And that is the church of Ephesus. Now if you read the book of Ephesians, you will realize that here was a church founded on godly values and principles and teachings of the Apostle Paul. Here was a church that was blessed with every spiritual blessing. And here in the book of Revelation, Jesus begins his judgment with this church, with the church of Ephesians. And Jesus began by listing the many good things about this church. Revelations 2, 1 to 3, Jesus says, I know your good works, I know your labor, I know your patience, I know that you cannot bear those who are evil, you don't tolerate evil, you have tested those who say that they are apostles and, not, uh, and you have found them to be liars, you have not been deceived, you have persevered and have labored for my name's sake and you have not given up, you have not become weary. What a commendation, isn't it? So here's a church that is involved in good works, that does not tolerate sin, a church that is persevering for the sake of the gospel, a church that is blessed with the gifts of wisdom and the gift of discernment. And yet, Jesus says, there is one thing that displeases me. Verses four. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You know, we often refer to our first love, to the 
teenage crush that we may have had with butterflies in our stomachs and so on. But when Jesus speaks about the first love, he's not speaking of an immature kind of love. Rather, he's speaking about an exclusive love. He's saying, I once occupied first place in your heart, but now you have allowed other things to take that place. In other, way, in other words, they have lost their fire, they have lost their passion. They are no longer devoted to Jesus. He is not the one thing that they desire above all. Church, it is significant that in these chapters of all the sins Jesus points out in these churches, in the seven churches, actually in the five churches, he points out sins such as adultery, covetousness, lukewarmness, false teachings, the Jezebelic spirit, uh, spiritual blindness, and so on. But probably it was the Ephesian church who hurt him the most. Because that's the first sin that he addresses. You are left your first love. Revelations 2, verse 5. Jesus continues. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstands from its place unless you repent. The first works that God is, that Jesus is referring to here are the works resulting out of the love they had for God. You know, we can be involved in doing loads of good stuff, lots of good work, good works, but if these good works are not motivated by our love for Jesus, and in the process of doing these good works, if our love for Jesus does not increase, then we are left our first love. And those will just remain good works. Jesus calls the church to repent. That means turn back to your first love. And give God, give Jesus the rightful place in your life. Or else he will remove the lampstand. What does that mean? You no longer will be effective. You may lose your anointing. I believe this warning to the Ephesian church is intended for the global church, local church, and for each of us personally. Also remember this, our lack of love for Jesus can affect the entire congregation. You know, the church in Ephesians that Jesus was addressing, probably not everybody in the church had lost their first love. But Jesus was addressing the entire church, isn't it? Church, is Jesus your greatest desire? Are you seeking him more than any other? Do you love him the most? Listen to me carefully, and please don't hear me wrong, okay? The only way that you can love God is not by trying hard not to sin or trying hard to walk the straight and narrow. The only way that you can truly love God is to seek his presence, to rest in his love, to long for him above all others, other things. Because when you are in your, his presence, even, even if you fail and fall, you will not want to remain there because when you are in the presence of God, you will always want to obey him and please him. And you will call out to God and he will restore you. Amen. 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 Remember David? He lost it, didn't he? When he removed his focus from God and feasted his eyes on Bathsheba. Solomon lost it when he started focusing on the pleasures of the world. Peter lost it when he focused on fear. And there are so many other accounts in the Bible. But thankfully, they turned back to their first love and they were restored and reinstated in God. But there are others, like Judas, like Ananias and Sapphira, who removed their focus from God and focused on money and power and probably popularity. And they did not return to their first love. And even today, we know great preachers and teachers, Christian preachers and teachers who began so powerfully moving under the point, anointing of the Holy Spirit, but lost it when they focused on money, on power, and on popularity. 
they walked away from their first love. You know, we need to be on our guard. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells, warns us, it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. We need to be with God. We need his grace. Church, we can only love God because he first loved us. Amen. Even when we rejected him in the past, he never gave up on us, did he? Just imagine, what if God gave up on us? I dread to think of a life, of a future, or even of eternity without God. You know, there's a song that we sing, I remember. I think we sang that a few weeks back. And as we were singing that song, I began to remember how God never gave up on me. You know, as a young adult, I had turned away from him. I had compromised my values and principles in which I was brought up. And for years, God kept reaching out to me, orchestrating events and people to come to me with the gospel message, to take me to meetings where the gospel was preached. And even though my heart was hardened at that time, even when I went after other gods, Jesus didn't give up on me. I remember the many times he rescued me from the grips of death. And I just trembled to think, what if I died outside of Jesus? I remember the time I got my first Bible. I was on work and I was checking into this hotel and I was given a room and that particular hall floor was supposed to be haunted. And I refused that room. And later on, one of my colleagues comes to, comes to me with a New Testament and says, if you have Jesus in your life, you don't have reason to fear. And that was my first Bible when I started reading the Bible. I remember soon after God led me to this God-fearing, God-loving group of people who accepted me and loved me for the way I was, just accepted me. And it was there that I surrendered my life to Jesus. But still, I didn't feel loved because I thought Jesus loved this group of people more than me because I didn't feel worthy to be loved. And you know, like Simone says at the beginning, God meets you where you are. And Jesus met with me. I had this tremendous divine encounter with Jesus where he overwhelmed me with his love. And I couldn't deny anymore that he didn't love me enough. And I started going to church. And I felt inferior to the rest of the people because they knew when to say amen. They knew when to raise their hands. They knew uh, scripture. They knew everything. And I felt so inferior and insignificant compared to them. And I used to think, will I ever be like that? And God met me again where I was. I was in this big meeting, maybe over 200 people, and he used this visiting minister who called out to me. He was moving powerfully under the Lord in the Holy Spirit. And he described what I was wearing, a white shirt with pink flowers. And he said, that young lady, he spoke to me and he says, God has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. You are special to him. God met me where I was. Now, why am I sharing this with you? It's not about me, but about the loving God who never forsakes or who never gives up on you. I encourage you all to remember, like Simone said, God meets us where we are in a very unique way. And I want you to remember the way God never let you go. And that would cause you to return to the first love, to your first love. Amen. David also remembered. He said, how can I forget all these benefits of the Lord? Psalm 103. He said, God redeemed me from the pit. He forgave me. He healed me. He strengthened me. He blessed me with every goodness. How can I remember, forget? Church, it's good to remember how God never let go of you. Listen carefully. I am not asking you to visit your sinful past because your sins have been forgiven and removed as far as the east is from the west. But remember that God loves you and never gave up on you. But most of all, you all remember how Jesus loved you so much that he took your place on the cross. He hung on the cross paying the penalty for your sin and my sin taking your shame and your guilt upon himself. You know, 
no greater love has any man known, or we will never know such great love again. Church, there are several signs of a dying love for Christ. And let me give you three main signs and ask you to search your heart and see whether you have grown cold towards Jesus. The first sign is, your love for Christ is dying if you keep finding excuses not to spend time with him. In Luke chapter 14 verse 18, Jesus tells a parable about a man. He sent his servant to invite all his friends to a great feast that he, was prepared, he had prepared. But the scripture says that the man's friends, all with one consent, began to make excuses. One said, I just bought a piece of land. I have to attend to it. Another said, I have to test the oxen that I just bought. Another said, I'm just newly married. I need to go on my honeymoon. Now, all these were rejecting intimate fellowship with their master. The master had prepared a table full of blessings available for all his friends. But everyone was simply too busy or too preoccupied. And Jesus is making a very clear point in this parable. And listen to me carefully. Each of these good, legitimate things becomes sinful when it takes priority over the Lord. You can do many good things. You can have many good excuses. Even your job, your family, your businesses. If any of those things takes priority over God, it can become sinful. If you can go about your daily life facing demands and meeting all those demands, but you don't find time to spend time with your Father, Heavenly Father, and not feel bothered about it, not affected by it, then that's a sign that you're losing your first love. The second one, your love for Christ is getting lukewarm if you neglect fellowship. Hebrews 10.25 not neglecting to meet together as, is the, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. If you consider the church the body of Christ, then you will not neglect meeting together. Church, listen to me carefully. Online services is the last option. Only if you are prohibited to come together and we cannot come together or for some other valid reason. Online services is the last option. It's God's idea that we meet as a congregation. It was true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. It's true today. Amen. Just because someone hurt you or forgot to appreciate you is not a reason not to come to church. Having to wear this it's not a risk, reason not to come to church. The mask for most of us, or most people, it's a safety measure, and we respect that. To many, it's an inconvenience, to all of us, in fact, and we understand that. But this mask is not persecution or a reason to neglect coming together. Actually, I'm thankful for this mask because I can sing loudly in church. <laughs> This morning, I was singing, I was worshipping, and kids started laughing. And he came and hugged me and said, Lavi, please don't sing that song that says, uh, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. <laughs> because even God wouldn't be able to do anything out about it. Okay. Church, this is not persecution. Let us be thankful that we can still come together to worship God, to encourage one another, to praise him, and to enjoy his goodness and his presence. You know, the early church continued to meet secretly, even when they were prohibited. They met in catacombs and so on, at the risk of being uh, martyred, actually. Even today, we hear so many churches Pastors been persecuted, executed for meeting together. So many churches meeting underground, even today, in different countries. 
In Sri Lanka, we know this church which was planted a long time ago in the village. You know, the pastors and the members of this church probably spend more time in hospital than in church because they were assaulted all the time, many years now. And the church was burned down so many times, but recently we heard that the pastor said, we're not going to build the church anymore. They continue to meet on the slab of the floor in open air. Yeah, because the church was burned so many, many times, so they said it's useless now putting up. But they continue to meet on that slab of concrete. It's not foolishness. They have recognized the love of God. They have made Jesus their first love. And they know the value of coming together. How much more should we be thankful that we can still meet together and worship God, isn't it? So neglecting the fellowship of believers for invalid reasons is a sign of lukewarmness. And there are so many of you here that I want to really appreciate. I don't want to mention names, but you know who you are. In spite of many inconveniences, having little children and babies, you still continue to come to church. People like Auntie Willow, facing challenges in life, still she's here to encourage us and to worship God together. We appreciate that. There are many of you who work long hours, 10, 11, 12 days without a day off. Still you come here to church. And as much as we appreciate you, remember that God honors you. Amen. 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 Yes. Thirdly, I won't dwell on this long. Your love for Christ is dying if you have given into habitual sin. That is, you continue sinning with no repentance and still call yourself a Christian. Church, I hope none of us here have grown cold towards Jesus. When God asks us to love him above all, it is not because he doesn't want us to love others, because human love, it's precious. Let's turn to Mark 12, 30 to 31. What does it say? And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What this means is this. Unless you love God first, you will not be able to love others in a meaningful way. It is only when you love God first and when you are in his love that you can love others in a Christ-like love, with a Christ-like love. Love between husbands and wives, parents and children, our one another in church, our service to the world out there. All these relationships will be meaningful and God-honoring if we are first in the love of God, if we have Jesus as our first love. That's why God wants us to put him first. Amen. Is your love for Jesus exclusive? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to return to your first love. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to guard your affection for Jesus. John Piper famously said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. We were created to glory for God's glory. And when we live for his glory, meaning when we seek him first above all, then he is glorified. And in that, we find true satisfaction and purpose for life. Amen. Amen. Church, I will close soon. But if there's anybody here who has not yet made Jesus your first love, in other words, you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, Today is the day, not tomorrow. Coming to church or attending Bible studies does not make you a Christian. Earlier I shared in John 14 where Jesus said he's going to his father to prepare a place for us and that he's going to come back for us. And Thomas, he asked, Jesus, you're going, but we don't know how to get there. And Jesus answers saying, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one gets the father except through me. So you have to make a personal commitment to God, to Jesus. It's just between you and Jesus. Jesus is the only way. 
You need to believe that he loved you so much that he died for your sins and that he hung on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. You need to ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins. You need to invite Jesus into your heart and you need to surrender your life to Jesus. As I said, it's between you and Jesus, but don't put it off for tomorrow. Do it today if you have never invited Jesus into your heart. And if it's you, after this service, we would love to pray with you and minister to you and help you in this journey, in this wonderful journey as a Christian. Secondly, can I have the worship team, please? If any of you feel that you are drawn away from your first love, now is the time to come back to your first love. Jesus is waiting with his arms open wide to receive you into his presence. And again, the pastoral team is here to pray for you, to minister to you after the service. Can I now ask you to please stand up and let's worship together to God. With worship God together and let this song be very meaningful and pray it or sing it from the bottom of your heart.